Welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Listen in as we discuss all things business, growth, and marketing with business owners, thought leaders, and entrepreneurs. And now, here's your host, founder of Roundhouse, the creative agency, Saul Edmonds. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Grow Your Business podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Chris Williams from Bodhi Yoga Studio around the topic of maintaining physical and mental flexibility. Chris, welcome, and how are you going today? Good, thank you, mate. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no worries at all. It's really great to have you on. Um, and given our our topic too, it's uh, apart from the fact that it's kind of topical right now too, with everyone um, everyone being at home and and uh, and I think especially um, even if they don't do things like yoga, I think it's certainly the topic that we're going to talk about today is really relevant, really important. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree, mate. We are a lot of us are stuck in uh, stuck in our homes, and we can't really do much. We can't. We're working from home. We're doing everything from home. So life is kind of a uh, <laughs> in a bit of a bubble at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's funny. I think a lot of the conversations I've been having too are also about the fact that despite everything and all the negativity and all the different repercussions that this is happening to is that in some ways it's like a weird blessing in disguise too, where people have different, um, I suppose you'd say realizations about things that they would really like to do or things that they could do better or, you know, any, any number of things that, you know, happen as a result of being thrown into the mix in a, in, well, not a new environment, an environment they're very familiar with, but something that they, in a new way of experiencing it. I totally agree. And I think it's hilarious because I'm like, you know, if you had all the time in the world to do whatever you wanted, what would you do? And people are, oh, I don't have any time. I've got to go to work. Like, you know, I've got to get the train. I've got to take the bus. I've got to do this. I've got to do that. You spend, you know, an hour to two hours a day traveling to and from work. You've got that time to do what you want with it. You know, I want to learn guitar. I want to read a book. I want to, uh, you know write a story or write a book, you know, whatever it is, you've got this time to do it. You know, I want to learn yoga. I want to, I want to get physically fit and strong. Yeah. We now have the time. We've now been given this almost a blessing. Um, if it is. Like. Yeah, it's funny. It's funny. Um, and actually with that in mind too, I'll get you just before we dive into the main topic, I'll just give you, um, I'll just get you, if you wouldn't mind, just giving a, like an introductory um, uh, introduction about, yourself about the studio a um, little bit about your history and the sort of services that that the studio um, provides as well and and your and your role like what you do in in the studio too sure absolutely um, okay so well Bodhi Yoga started uh, two and a half years ago um, it sort of came out of nowhere I I Spent a bit of time traveling uh, to India and became a, you know, a certified yoga teacher. I firstly went there for, for 10 days and did like what they call a yoga retreat. Um, where you just basically, you're involved in the ashram life. Um, you know, we had over 120 students at my first ashram. And you're kind of living in this little village and you're, kind of, you're part of this beautiful community and you get to do a ton of yoga. And I had been practicing for a little bit at the time. Um, but I was by no means an expert. I definitely could not touch my toes. I had some of the worst flexibility. Um, suffered a lot of a lot of pain in my body as well um, mm. from inflammations and I've had a couple of whiplashes in my life. Um, and so, like you know, that's kind of what led me into the yoga world. Um, I was seeing a, a chiropractor and a massage therapist um, very regularly, spending lots and lots of money, and would only really get. You know, I wouldn't really get, um, after two days, the body would just go back to normal. You know, I'd still have the pain, the wake up, mm. tight, sore, and that sort of stuff. And so, you know, my history comes into, I actually got booked in with the wrong massage therapist. And this, this is one of the most, this is a pivotal moment in my life um, because the guy, I totally judged him. Um, and he was this skinny guy, super skinny. And I used to think, if you can't give me a strong you know, deep tissue massage, how are you going to help me, you know? Mm. Anyway, during the massage, he said, mate, I see you come here quite regularly. And if you really want to help your neck and your back and you want to get your body into, into proper alignment, I really recommend yoga for you. I, 
I wouldn't just recommend any teacher. I'd recommend you go and see a teacher that actually knows what he's doing. And uh, that was almost eight years ago now. And to be perfectly honest, I didn't like yoga very much. Um, the teacher was a bit weird. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he would kind of be sitting there in this weird posture, you know, with his legs in what we call lotus with the, with the feet up on the knees and up on the thighs. And uh, he'd walk in and he wouldn't really say much. You know, and I, it was a beginner's class and uh, I found it weird. And then at the end of class, he would sing these mantras to me and I never knew what these mantras really meant. Never was told. Um, I was just told that I had to learn this sequence and I had to get better at it. And I was like, well, I'm paying you to teach me, mate. Like, why, why am I having to learn to do yoga by myself, you know? Uh, anyway, and then, you know, that, I kind of fizzled out of that. I only did it once a week and um, fizzled out. And uh, then I eventually found um, Bikram Yoga, which is a, another big topic of discussion at the moment. And, uh, you know, I guess without going into too much depth on that, um, Bikram was a bit of a cult following, has a bit of a cult following. And obviously with the, with the current circumstances that if you haven't watched the movie, maybe, maybe you should on Netflix, um, you know, that his, his, what, what he's done for the yoga world hasn't been fantastic. Um, and, but I still love the practice. You know, it's 26 poses done twice and it's, it was a 90 minute practice. And for me, it was what I needed. I came from a, from a sporting background and from a high level sporting background. And I was always, you know, in the mindset that you've got to push hard, you've got to push your body, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to push yourself for it to be really, to be really doing something. Um, so I loved it. It got me into yoga, got me into a really consistent routine. Then I went to India and I discovered that there's more than 26 poses. Mm. There's over 2,000 asanas. Or Is that right? 2,000? 2,100. There's Holy a moly. book that, I'm, that, I, that I use for, to, to get, gain inspiration. Um, some of them are very similar, you know, but there's slight variations. Um, mm. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of yoga poses. And uh, we did yoga for five hours a day. And um, that was hectic. But... <laughs> What I saw in that seven days in my body, in my mind, um, completely changed everything for me, you know? Um, and yeah, seven years on, I'm now a 500 hour Ashtanga yoga teacher, which funnily enough was the style of yoga that I first went to go and see with the weirdo guy who would sit in these awkward positions and sing mantras at me. I never thought in my life I would sing a mantra I now sing a mantra pretty much every day. I know three very well and I know about 30, you know, if I was to see the lyrics in front of me, I would, I would be able to sing them and I know what they mean. Uh, I know what they do for me and I know that what, you know, what they're about. And um, yeah, so it's like full circle, you know, you, <laughs> you just come in this full circle where what, what you think you don't need, the, the universe or the world kind of almost hands it to you on a silver platter and, and, and shows you the way. Yeah. I guess it's also like I've, I've had my own similar sort of experiences when you have certain, like all of us have, have preconceptions, right. Out about yes. what, what something is, you know, about what it, what it means or you, or you dismiss it out of hand, you know, for, um, reasons that you probably don't really even know at the time. It's just you you know something. Um, and I guess even for the, you know, I could say even for myself as, as open-minded as I like to think I am, you know, about things, there's certain things even now that I would go, no, yes. But then I, I find that I find that journey of, of any sort and what you were just describing really fascinating because – you know, then you also come to the realization of even like when you were discussing a mantra, you know, you, you didn't know and you dismissed it at an, an earlier stage. And then through this process, like you, you come to the realization of its role or like of why you're doing it. Like it's got meaning because, you know, you've kind of, um, you won, I don't know about you, but like when you come to a realization about how effective certain things are for your body, 
then other things that are, you know, say like the mantra, for example, when you finally realize just through the doing of it, then you realize after the fact, like how something like the mantra is actually linked to that, like why it's relevant. And um, yeah. And then you kind of go, I get it. (laughs) You know, and it's not usually, (laughs) it's not like I, I remember any instances like that with me when, you know, we've been doing like martial arts and you're trying to do something, you try and try and try and try. Then you hit a point when one day you just do it like a little bit right. And you go, oh, right. And then it's just like a complete light bulb moment, yes. even if it's a little one. And then yeah. all of a sudden, all these other things just click into place and all the other things that your instructor is saying have meaning. And you're going, oh, I shouldn't have thought you were an idiot or, <laughs> or I shouldn't, <laughs> or I shouldn't have, you know, you go. And there's like this flood of I'm sort of realization. So yeah, I really that's relate. That's the, the funny thing with, with yoga as well. Like this. I think that's with anything really, you know, I like to take what resonates with me now. Like I like to more listen to, okay, does that, does that make sense to me? Cause there are some teachings in yoga that um, are centuries old and that, you know, that, that was thousands of years ago, like between five and 10,000 years ago. Some of the yoga sutras were, that, that's when the yoga sutras were put together. And some of the stuff is absolutely still critical of this day and age and we should resonate with it. And some of the stuff I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to take it this way. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of position, um, I'm going to sort of position myself um, to take it, take it the way I will, will, will perceive it for what, what feels right to me. Just because you're saying something to me, it's you know that, that's why I think sometimes you know some some yoga can become religious almost. You know, whereas oh totally yeah I'm, yeah I'm like well if it doesn't resonate with me then I won't I'm not, I'm not going to make it a part of me. And, you know, that's one thing I learned from the, from the, the teacher, you know, eight years ago was if I'm going to do something in another language to people that are in the Western society who have not been exposed at the level I've been exposed to, I'm going to explain to them what this means, you know, so that they can actually go, yeah, that really resonates with me. And they can maybe join in even one day or in, in the moment, you know, so that um, hmm. it's not just some weird white guy singing a singing a song in another language to them. <laughs> yeah, because you do, because it does still, I think you do, despite, you know, all, all the, the importance and I guess the perceived importance of, of um, you know, rituals that are passed down through, through centuries and through different teachers and, and the importance that people place on that, you do still, I think, to some extent, have to take in the, the cultural things of like another kind of not even a whole society but like even a group of people what are they you know if someone's coming to learn something in a particular way is 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 how you're teaching it you know how are you going to teach that effectively like still bring it back to that because you're still then running a business too so well that's it if you go to if you go to eastern philosophy then you're only gonna you're gonna have a very small niche you're not gonna reach some people don't don't want to hear the mantra i don't really sing them to be honest to be honest very often to my class because i kind of see that you know the western society isn't as ready for it you know i do want to hold special workshops um where those that are interested in it can can come and um can come and join in and uh and that's really what it's about is some people are ready and I wasn't ready eight years ago. <laughs> I was completely yeah. not ready. Um, but some people are like, okay, I want to hear more about this. You know, when we, the last time we went to India, we, had, uh, we took seven of our students with us. Four of them became yoga teachers and three of them you know, did a week to two weeks and, and just came and experienced ashram life and, uh, and yoga teacher life. So, yeah. Um, How would you, just on, just kind of, I guess, circling back to the, um, the topic then too about the idea of, physical and mental flexibility. Like how do you sort of see like the topic? I guess I, I've got a particular idea of what I think that means when we first were thinking about what the topic would be um, and then you were going to be involved in this. But mm. then how do you sort of see that in a, in a different way, like a correlation to that journey that you were talking about too? In, oh, yeah. in, in, in the, I just, I just had a like a little um, realization then, which was, well, yeah. I mean, you can go, 
mental flexibility being the idea of being able to adapt. And then what you were saying, it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, when you're kind of forced to adapt and then like how good you are at doing that, it Mm. could then also just mean that, you know, a willingness to do it, I suppose, too. You know, once you have a, and then sometimes, you know, like when you were saying before, there was a catalyst for that. There's, there's often, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I, I feel often there has to be some sort of catalyst for that to then happen. Mm. And then you change your thinking around it and you've got the, but I think to some extent you have to have an inherent, um, like flexibility within your thinking to do that. What do you reckon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I used to think I was an open person um, and I am, I'm definitely probably more open than some people that I've, that, that I've met in my life. But, you know, I guess, you know, the body stores a lot of our emotions. And if we don't, if we don't take the time to unravel, peel, peel back the, you know, I love to use the philosophy, peel back the, the layers of the onion. You know, mm. if we just sit at surface level, then we guess, I guess we kind of live our life at surface level. We don't really, we don't really delve into the mind or the body. And um, I love connecting the two. And, you know, my physical abilities were, were pretty poor, but, you know, and seeing the mental shifts of what's happened when I've, spent time on working on my physical body, then also spent time working on my mental body, how it changes my physical body at the same time. Yeah, right. The other way around too. Absolutely. The two are yeah. not separate. You know, I don't no, think they're intertwined. Mentally. It's it's where we're absolutely into intertwined and um yeah, like if if my mind is 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 erratic and it don't get me wrong, it's you know, I'm definitely not perfect every day. I still have days where, you know, I'm running businesses. And things are hectic and, and I've got so much to do and I'm overwhelmed. But I realize that, you know, sometimes just going to spend two minutes on my mat, just going to sit there or doing some breathing, doing maybe a, maybe doing a small meditation, whether that be a guided or a, it gives my mind the chance to, to unravel and to realize that I don't, these, these feelings of overwhelm and stress and that, that, that do come on, they don't need to be a part of my life. They don't need to be there. Mm. And it's only going to make me less productive anyway. Mm. You know, I'm sitting there in my mind and saying the same story over and over again, then mm. I'm never going to be effective in what I'm doing. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's that observational sort of skills too. Like you were saying, like you, you, you noticing how things have an effect on each other, that, that idea that, you know, even being aware of when you do things in a particular way, whether that's like how you think of it and that affects like either how well you train or, you know, or what what you do in the studio. But then the other way around, I um, there's a few occasions, you know, that I can sort of think of when I've been doing things where for whatever reason you've just, done something physical in a particular way, whether it's, you know, a really good stretch and how relaxed you feel by that, um, by Mm. that process of having a stretch. And then the way you think about things is actually different. And I suppose taking the time to observe those things too is important as well, you know, because then you, you have a realization about it, which is, I don't know about you, but I, I don't think that can be underestimated because it helps you helps you then know the importance. So I remember it for next time, you know, yeah. <laughs> you feel like yeah. that was, especially if you've done it like for the first time and, or then you just happen to do it again, um, you know, by accident, you know, hypothetically. And then you go, wow, that was, I remember that from last time. You know, it's <laughs> like the idea of having a, a really nice stretch before you go to bed. It always yes. makes always makes you feel amazing. I, 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 you know, you feel. I, mean, I don't know about you, but any time I I do that, and I I should be more mindful and do it every single night. I don't do that, but when I do do it, I I always have a fantastic sleep. <laughs> exactly. 
Well, that's it. It's the mind body connection. It, it relaxes the mind. And it, it is so funny just like what you were saying about not doing it every day. And I, I'm not perfect in myself. This is one of the reasons why I love to travel to India when I'm forced to do four to five hours a day of yoga. You know, I, I have changed <laughs> that's a lot of yoga. Mate, it's unbelievable. Like you, the, the changes that you see, your mental, your mind, your body, it's unbelievable what, what that level can do. And even taking that back into the Western world, you know, even if I jump on my mat, you know, three or four times a week um, and, and then do some strength yoga stuff as well. Um, it really just puts you into such a better state, you know, which is why I generally like to start my morning with, with yoga, you know. And that's what I was going to say was like, I think it's the funny thing is we often, we often, the mind, the mind's like, well, I know I need to do this. I know I should be doing this. It is good for me. But it's like, there's that, the, the, the dualities of the mind. There's, you know, the, where, where one side of the mind's like, ah, we can just chill out. We don't have to worry about it. We'll do it, we'll do it tomorrow. Um, when there's the other side going, hang on a minute, but this really helps us in such a profound way. Um, <laughs> and I battle with that as well. You know, there's some days where I'm just like, you know what, I just can't be bothered getting on my mat today. I just, I just don't feel like it. As much as I know how much it's good for me, mm. some days I just don't want to do it. And I think that's where I've sort of learned to understand that, understand myself but I, that's just help, hopefully what I help to pass on to my students that it's okay to feel that way mm. you know that we all those emotions they're they're there they all live inside of us we own all of them mm. and that's okay we can, we can we can have those emotions we can have those feelings and some days we don't want to get it on the map sometimes we're going to be the mind is going to be erratic and it is going to take control in areas and I think like through the journey of years of, of practicing regularly and, and, and getting on my mat more regularly, I start to realize that I have less of those moments. Mm. Yeah, so. true. I suppose that's, that's, yeah, I think that's a really key point. And yeah, and you hear people talking about that in, you know, when people are talking about um, uh, good work practices or, you know, great, you know, new systems when you're trying to optimize things in your business and, you know, that, that idea of routine and then as a part of getting to that point, you know, how do you, how do you actually establish these things? And there's, and there's often that conversation about the fact that, you know, it is okay to have these other things that you're not, it's not necessarily one or the other. It's kind of almost like the acceptance of that you have them mm. and as I found like it's it's funny. It's almost like when you you just go, that's okay. It's like that other little voice in your head goes, uh, because they're always fighting and mm. they're always having a <laughs> one's <laughs> fighting the other one. Cool. As soon as you go, um, you know, not that you literally say this in your mind, but you know, it's okay that that's that that thought is there. Um, it's like they don't necessarily disappear but their importance, it's like the person in the room shouting at you going, hey, listen to me. And if he's just like, yeah, no worries. Yeah, that's, that's all right. I acknowledge, I acknowledge you know, that you're there. I can, eventually I can, they'll, they'll, you know, if you don't feed it, like it'll just eventually start to starve and yes. it'll kind of disappear. And like you were saying, like that's that perfect way to say it is that it just gets, it, it gets less over time. Yeah. It doesn't disappear and it kind of shouldn't disappear because then it'll it's always going to be there anyway you know it just gets less and you get more of this and less of that and i think that kind of relates perfectly to to the topic you know the mental flexibility side of things is you you can you, you can start to go okay well that's the way the mind is and i'm okay with that hmm. um and i think you know when we get to the point where we where we get either sick and tired of listening to that voice that's not really that doesn't really take us anywhere, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we start to go, you know what? I don't need to listen to that anymore. You know, and we start. I've been talking about this with, with a mate of mine um, the other day. You know, just talking about the stories we tell ourselves. You know, I remember when I was in a previous business. Well, I guess I still have the, the physical fitness business as well. But when I was in when I was in business with a with a, with a previous business partner, you know, some things went wrong in that business, and I remember that was the story. I would continue to latch onto, you know, people would ask me questions or how's things going? Yeah, it's going really good. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And then all of a sudden this story would come up and I would, wasn't really aware of that story, you know? Mm. Um, 
until I started to go, okay, hang on a minute. That's not serving me. It's actually just pulling me down in that particular part of my life. And I, mm. I guess through the journey of yoga and having that mental flexibility to go, okay, what's happening? What am I saying? I don't need to have that part of my life. That story is old and it does not serve me in any shape or form. Um, and yeah, like that really is a big one, I think. So. Yeah, I think like the power of which I, I know everybody's experienced and, um, you know, and continues to some, um, some people more than others is that it's kind of the overwhelming nature of things that are negative, you know, in a, and that how, how, um, you know, kind of awkwardly powerful <laughs> those things are, like things creep into your, into your mind space Yes. And whatever it is, like a story like that or something that you don't like and, and the focus that you put on it. But it's, it's once you end up, um, in my experience anyway, like when you end up just being able to, through whatever, let's call it mental flexibility, you know, for mm. the sake of the conversation, yeah. you know, through that being able to just kind of shift that focus. It's not like it's even, it's not like it's really even, a new focus, you take that energy you were putting into that, which seems to always, I don't know, in my experience, it always seems to suck up so much more energy than when you put it into something nice that you're enjoying, where you're doing yoga. And then once you start doing it, it seems so easy. And it always seems so kind of effortless. One, because you're enjoying it. And then you realize the benefits and you go, And there's always that, um, I'm sure heaps of people would resonate with this where you go, oh, why didn't I do that before? You know that? You know, when when you you go, oh, that's like, how crazy, how crazy is that? Why, why didn't I do that before? It was so easy and it feels so great. Well, that's it. We make things so complicated. Like uh, we try and, you know, my man of mine's doing a lot of inner child work at the moment, you know, which, which which I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to disregard that. I think some of that stuff's really important. Some of the traumas that we've, that the people have experienced through their life, um, we hold on to that stuff, you know, through injuries, through, you know, it's just, it's, I guess it's my thoughts and some of the readings that I, that I, that I listen to and watch, um, you know, that we have things that show up on certain sides of our bodies and certain parts of our bodies. And that stuff is important to, to, to look back on and reflect and accept but it doesn't have to be our story. It doesn't have to be where we go with our life and, and what, what drives us and what, what, what sort of, I guess, almost pulls us in a certain direction. If we're not aware of the stories that are coming in our life, it's almost like that's pulling us, pulling us in that certain direction that um, we don't need to be going in. We need to look at the story and say, what, are, what story do I want to create? You know, And that's one of the things that I, I love with what yoga's done for me and what I what I do for other people is I help them to, to sort of see, to see that as well, because I've been pulled in directions that I didn't realize that I was doing myself, you know, like I, my mental stories and my subconscious mind that I was feeding was definitely pulling me in directions that I didn't realize. And that's why like I now realize, you know, yoga, obviously it's a, a lot, a lot of poses in there that open up the heart. I think the heart is our probably our most important area. People that suffer from stress and anxiety um, at such a level that that part of their body can be so shut off, um, you know, compassion, empathy, and, and just generally feeling. And so, and I definitely experienced that in my life as well, where I was just completely shut off, did not realize that I was shut off and was walking down a path that was not amazing. It wasn't resonating with me at the highest level. And, you know, so now I kind of love... I make sure that when I make my decisions, I, I, I look to the inside of myself and I, and I look to see if it is actually something that resonates with my heart. With my heart. And yeah, it's quite profound what does and doesn't resonate <laughs> with me anymore. Um, yeah, yeah, I know exactly where you're coming from. I think there's, a, there's certainly a part when people are introduced to, you know, to yoga or to martial arts or to other practices which i guess parts of probably western civilization more than than elsewhere deem to be um like insert whatever word you want to insert here they deem it to be you know 
to oh well or, or too or too just like too airy fairy or too philosophical not because of any other reason but because of their preconceptions mm. but then once you're I'm, and I'm sort of saying that too because then when I remember distinctly like the first time when we actually had a person in a taekwondo club who was doing yoga and mm. just as a as a uh, as a part of that she sort of said hey do you want to do um just as a part of our um warm down afterwards we'll just do um, you know, some yoga and we just implemented it for a while it wasn't like a a, a strict um, sort of regime but she was just introducing us and i remember specifically thinking my first thought was oh it's going to be um you know i, I was thinking i'm i'm pretty I think I'm pretty strong and pretty flexible and, you know, mm. and and pretty good at this stuff. And then being introduced to that, having this idea that it's going to be, I don't know, all flowy and sort of soft and easy. And, and it was like far, my first experience was, was, well, it was really interesting and really great. But at the same time, it was, it was really difficult, like the holding poses. And I was like, Oh my God, I don't, I had no, idea my my preconception that i thought i was i totally across it and i was like yeah i know what this is yes and then we were doing i was like man this is hard <laughs> <laughs> really really difficult and we did it a few times and i could feel myself getting you know stronger and the benefits like even in a, a, like a pretty short amount of time we did it a, a, you know a number of times after class and um the effects that it had on strength than yes. for martial arts and flexibility was astounding just yeah. absolutely astounding couldn't couldn't believe it and then um of course we didn't actually do it anymore after that which was a shame <laughs> <laughs> yes i think that's the thing uh, but i would so just just on that sort of subject too just on a on a um a nuts and bolts like yep. reason for for people um doing yoga what's the um what what would you say is one of the big advantages of being fl uh flexible in a physical sense or actually i'll just rephrase that to, to have that that sort of strength and flexibility that i mean yoga gives you what's the some of the real advantages? i think the biggest one is probably just um i guess energy people often want to feel good they want to wake up feeling good and people often either wake up in pain or they're tired um, so I think yoga is the practice that you can do until you're 100 you know it's, it's a practice it's, it's, it's a practice that really heals the body it can prevent things because we are again what I believe is we're, we're so heavily connected with the mind and body so that if we are working on our mobility in our body and our mind then uh, which is yoga. I mean, yoga is a, a meditation. It's a meditation. It's, it's a moving meditation. Um, mm. so I think that's the biggest. That's benefit. a really good way. That's a really good way to put it. I, I actually haven't haven't really heard it said like that before. I like that. Yeah. I yeah. Absolutely. I mean, meditation isn't just sitting down with your hands on your knees and focusing. But meditation can be in 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 any moment. You know whether that be driving along and you glance over at the tree to the left and you think, wow, that tree is so beautiful. That's a mini meditation. That's mindful meditation. Mindfulness. Uh, you know, yeah. You're, yeah. And you're moving in and out of poses, you know, and there's, you know, I'll talk a bit about what the, um, what styles of, of, of practice that we actually do at Bodhi, because each of them, I think, deliver a different type of meditation to the mind as well. That, that sort of relaxation, you know, it's something like a flowing class, something that you sort of maybe maybe have experienced. Um, and some people hate these styles, to be perfectly honest. And I didn't love them when I first started doing them. And now one of my favorite styles. Um, but this is where you, you know, you're kind of linking that breath to movement. And so you don't really have the time to think. You don't really have to think, oh, did I put the dishes on? Like, did, I, you know, did I pick up, did I, did I put the garbage out? Did I, did I do that thing on my to-do list? Whatever it was, that thing at work, that phone call. Because... It's, a, it's, it's more of a challenging practice, uh, or it can be more of a challenging practice. You can obviously make it very simple as well, but you can make it super advanced. Either way, at whatever level that your body and mind is at, you know, that sort of flowing movement can really still the mind at such a high level. 
Um, mm. The other style that I'm trained in as well is, is Hatha, Hatha yoga. And Hatha yoga is um, the, kind, of, kind of the top of the tree where all other yoga um, stems from. And there's over 200 different styles of yoga out there as well. Um, and I think a lot of people have experienced a class with maybe a teacher that wasn't great or a style that didn't resonate with them. They weren't in the mental space to be able to, to be able to go through that particular practice or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and they have a, an idea or a preconceived idea now of what all yoga is, you know, mm. Hatha is one of the most physically challenging poses that instead of flowing through your poses, your normal Hatha class is more of a stop start, you know, where you kind of, it's, it's like a, I'll talk about yin yoga really briefly because then I feel like half is almost in between the flow and the yin. So your yin or your deep stretch style is what a lot of West Western society loves, especially in our studio, because you're sitting in poses for three to five minutes. Mm. Um, and people will either shy away from that and not want to deal with whatever's going on in their mind because you do have to deal with some stuff, you know, because you're directly linking the mind to one muscle for three to five minutes, which is generally, if you're listening, is generally telling you stuff or bringing stuff up or, and helping you to release that, mm. you know? Um, whereas in a Huffer class, you know, you're kind, of, you're, you're kind of moving deeper into one pose, whereas in your yin style class, you're kind of holding a posture um, and you can move slightly deeper into a pose in, in yin or maybe you need to back away because you've gone too deep too quick, um, but yeah. That's um, kind of the, the, the different styles and, and how, it, how they sort of, I guess, help the body and the mind as well. How does, how does then breathing, like you were talking about breathing there too, I was going to bring this up, but it's a good I'm sort of segue into this, about mm. where, where does breathing come or the importance of breathing come into the practice of yoga? Because I would imagine it's, it's sort of, it's a, it's a core part of yeah, it was the one thing how you do that things. changed my practice. Um, when I first went and did my teacher training in about, um, it was three and a half, I guess three and a half, four years ago now, I remember looking at the schedule, and you know we had not we had yoga at six a.m. We had pranayama um, at eight a.m. for an hour. And I looked at what pranayama was, and it was all these um, it's these breathing techniques. I didn't really delve too much more into it. I'm like, well, I'll just wait until I get there. But at the time, I thought in my mind, breathing. How is this going to help me? I breathe every day. I've been <laughs> doing it my entire life. I've gotten this far. I'm doing pretty well, right? <laughs> yeah, you're still alive, right? I'm still alive. I must yeah. be doing something good. Yeah. yeah, high fives all around. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it ended up being the game changer, mate. Like, honestly, like the um, absolute game changer. And it's one of my biggest passions now is to, is to have a consistent pranayama practice. There's over uh, 20 different styles of pranayama, different, different techniques, which help to expand our breath, you know. And, you know, the, the, the word pranayama, um, roughly translated, means life force extension. Mm. And our prana, the, 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 the Sanskrit or the old the Indian culture believes that our prana is the energy or our, or our soul that flows through our body. And mm. prana is what leaves our body when we die. Yeah, that your breath is, is your soul. Yes. Yeah, in effect, yeah. Ex exactly. Mm. And I mean, it kind of makes sense. You know, when you, look at a, when you look at a dog, for example, you know, a um, bit of a segue, but kind of on, to on, on topic at the same time. You know, like how many times a minute does a dog breathe? <laughs> you know, they're breathing a 50, fair bit. Yeah. You know, a fair bit. Yeah. How many times does a human breathe in a minute? You know, it's around about 16 to 20 breaths. Yeah. How many breaths does a turtle take? Two. Yeah, one, two, a minute. Yeah. They hold a, they would, yeah, like anything that's going to be generally uh, amphibious or sort of underwater has got to take deep, long breaths, hold it well, and then 
Yeah, which I'll which I'll actually get onto onto something else. Like after you say what you're going to say next, relating to that. Yeah. Well, I guess the key is is a dog. The average lifespan of a dog is ten to fourteen years. The average lifespan of a human, you know, seventy to ninety years. I guess we could say. The average lifespan of like a, tor- a turtle, a tortoise, will live up to two hundred years. Yeah, it's linked to so, the heartbeat then too, isn't it? Like the yes. to your. Uh, because the general rule of thumb I always remember from somewhere, I'm not sure, just from uh, absorbing information <laughs> from, yeah, some, yeah. <laughs> from around me, um, is that is that the quicker your heart beats, the shorter your lifespan. Correct. You know, if you've got more. And um, but I was just just on on that subject, or sort of on a related subject. For some reason, just recently, I, I, I was thinking about this movie that um, I still really love called uh, The Big Blue, which is this... Oh, yeah, the deep, deep sea divers. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah, the free divers. And I just, I yeah. absolutely love that movie. I, I just, I really want to watch again. The end of it is just, you know, it, it's just in, incredible. I love the sea, but it had this whole spate of... Um, this trend that I've had recently of them just watching videos and learning about uh, free diving Mm. and about the breathing and learning. There was one uh, one or two videos in particular, but there was a a TED talk that this renowned free diver gave on, on how I I think it was how he got to break the world record um, for free diving. And he was talking about breathing and he was showing how he would do this particular regime of breathing that they would have that's very specifically linked to then when they go down to a certain point, they have to, um, they have to hold their breath. But then the idea of, um, especially as they start to feel that there might be a sense of panic, if they're thinking about running out of breath, going down and then coming up. um, I I thought that's just the one absolutely remarkable but so closely aligned to that idea of mental flexibility which is is tied in very closely to discipline and controlling things without you know without delving into into panic and getting Mm -hmm. silly about i thought this this was just absolutely remarkable this level of precise control and capacity that this particular guy had over breathing over his breath and the, the increase of capacity, but what they sort of have to do to even uh, just before they dive, breathing in a particular way. Yes. And, and then when, you know, I was thinking, well, we're going to be talking. For some reason, that was the first thing that popped into my head was these videos about this guy breathing. Because <laughs> um, um, I know that it's such a big part of yoga. And that. I mean, uh, breath is our life, mate. Breath is our life. And. Yeah. If we Oxygen. learn to harness it and we learn to, to, to deepen it, to, to experience it, to, to, to look within and actually feel it, um, yeah, like it's a game changer. It is absolutely a game changer. You know? Yeah, well, it's like I suppose like whenever anybody's talking about meditation too, there's, that, there's a really big part of that. And, of course, that's in, in yoga too about focusing on your breathing and that you're mm. focusing on – you know, on that, that real mindfulness about when you're breathing. So, I mean, it's, it's all, it all seems to be to make such sort of sense and so closely a lot. Well, it's not closely aligned. It's a part of, you know, how we, how we perceive the world and how, how we think about things. Um, But like the, it's been, it's been really great um, sort of running through all this with you, with your, um, I'm um, your practice and your journey too, like up to this, this point now, uh, what do you, what do you see like for the studio? And then I guess even more so for yourself doing um, yoga into the future, like where you are now and where. Oh, yeah, I guess that's one of the, the big, one of the big ones that's sort of had to completely restructure my entire business model in a matter of hours after we, uh, you yeah. know, were forced to obviously close down. Um, and we, you know, we took it outdoors for a little bit, but a lot of people were just too scared to, to come out. Um, I wanted to, and, had, and we're sort of in isolation. Some people were 
had to self isolate for their fourteen days because they you know, flown overseas or whatever. Mm. And so, yeah, I guess the future now has been online. We've been we were one of the first businesses. I'm, I'm not sure um, in Australia, but definitely one of the first businesses in Queensland um, that made the flip, the switch. Because I mean, I'm, I'm part of this little community, and I'm I'm seeing some of these yoga studios were a week or two weeks behind um, getting getting themselves and and their students. Um, online so i feel like yeah moving forward i feel like we're always going to have an online presence now you know it's, it's a part of the world and it means i can open the studio up to anyone in the world as well that, that can practice at a time um and and with us you know at a, at a time uh that, that, that's convenient to them you know we've got yoga online where we do live classes and we've also then record our classes and we put them onto our yoga on demand section so if you if you want to um do one of our classes in your own time, then you have that ability as well. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think that's like, you know, it was it was something that people were doing anyway. But if if anything else, you know, if anything else outside of the good things that you can take out of all this happening at the moment is that it was a great catalyst to do that, um, you know, for you because it sounds like it's going well. Yeah, we've definitely got some people. I've been I've been doing some campaigns around Australia, and I'm about to launch a a 28 day reflection and isolation challenge as well mm. on, on Instagram and uh, just looking to keep attracting, you know, new people into our, in, into our community and our world. And um, yeah, like it's, it's been a good little journey and I'm actually, I'm actually enjoying quite a lot of it, to be honest. I'm, I'm, <laughs> That's fantastic. I can't wait to have my students back in the room, to be honest as well. It's kind of <laughs> weird teaching to yourself all the time through a microphone, you're looking down the screen going, is anybody actually there? And you, you see on your Zoom video that you know, they're, yeah. they're there, everybody is. But um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it takes a bit of a getting used to, I suppose. But you know, it's great that you're doing that. I think. But we'll um, just on uh, on that sort of subject too. Well, on what we've been talking about, I'll just ask you right now if you can if you can give everybody um, a quote. Um, you know that you've that you found relevant quote or just one that you really uh, that you really like that you like to share yeah, with absolutely us? absolutely so my favorite one of my favorite teachers in the world um, who's no longer with us anymore um, BKS Sayenga one of the founding fathers fathers of yoga in the West um, and he also was the person who brought yoga to the West back in the 50s um, mm. amazing man uh, and his quote that I absolutely love Yoga teaches us to cure what need not be endured and endure what cannot be cured. Yeah, nice. That's great. Thanks so much, Chris. It's been, it's been really great um, chatting today. Um, yeah, really appreciate it. So could you just um, let everyone know um, as well how best to get in contact with you and um, where you're located online? Anything else you'd like to share? Sure. Um, well, we're located in Milton, in Brisbane. Um, best way to get in contact would be either via phone. Um, you can give me a call direct. It's direct. The phone comes straight to me, 07-3876-4781. Obviously, on our website, Bodhi, bodhiyogastudio.com.au. Um, and if you're interested in doing some of our live online classes, um, probably best to, to send me an email, Chris. C H R A S at Bodhi Yoga Studio dot com dot au, um, and I can always forward you a link to, to understand a bit more about our live online or um, give you more. And just in case people don't know how to spell Bodhi, because um, it's yes, it's like different it's spelling. Just um, let them know. <laughs> uh, it's B O D H I, yep. as in the Bodhi tree, as in yeah. the Not tree where Buddha gained enlightenment. Not like, not like I said before when I thought it was like a cool variation on body. <laughs> <laughs> it's Bodhi. It's Bodhi, everybody. Oh, people Just do remember it. that. All right. <laughs> okay. So um, and with that in mind, that's actually it for today, guys. Thanks so much for listening in again to our podcast. We really appreciate it. Before we go, please leave your feedback as well as any suggestions for any topics that you would like us to discuss in future episodes. Thanks again for listening to the Grey Business Podcast and we'll see you again soon. Bye, guys. See you later.
Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of Grow Your Business. Have a great day.